Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to begin a series of videos on Hegel's aesthetics. In this first video, we'll cover the lengthy introduction to his lectures on fine art. Now, this is part of a broader series of videos I'll be doing on uh, aesthetic theory as I was invited to give a talk at an academic conference here in India next week over both this material from Hegel and also Kant's critique of judgment. So more videos coming to the channel soon on both of those works. But I think the best way to begin today is just by acknowledging the elephant in the room, which is, wasn't Hegel's view on art precisely that it's dead. Now, what people really mean when they say that is that Hegel did not situate art at the very end of history. He had an understanding that within a certain dialectical progression, when art finally um, gets its own idea correctly, that is to say, when it the thing that art is trying to do, when it actually gets it right, it's no longer art. Now it's religion. And religion's not the end of the story either. When religion finally gets what it's trying to do right, it's no longer religion. Now it's philosophy. The irony of the situation is you could only have a saying like art is dead attributed to Hegel precisely because he took art far more seriously than the average person today. The thing which art tries to do is to um, uh, disclose the absolute. Okay, And religion and philosophy also do that, obviously. They just do it at a higher level. But this is um, evidence that for Hegel, art is far more than just entertainment. Similar to uh, Julius Evola noting that a story like King Arthur and the Sword and the Stone was understood in the world of tradition to be the hermeneutical disclosure of certain spiritual absolutes regarding the legitimacy of rule, which has parallels in Persian and Greek mythology as well. It's something which, even if you show the story to a person in modernity because of a certain hermeneutical impoverishment, they won't even realize that that's what it's supposed to be. Instead, for them, it's merely a question of whether it was fun to watch the story, whether it was good entertainment. And Similarly, Hegel takes art very seriously in that he considers art to be, by definition, a mode of absolute spirit itself. Art allows absolute spirit to be disclosed precisely through the beautiful. And beauty is therefore defined as the sensible shining of the idea in which you have a certain unity of the notion and an exterior appearance. Although aesthetics is inherently concerned with beauty, we must, however, exclude the beauty of nature from consideration in order to focus on art as such. Contrary to expectation, this is because the beauty of man-made art is not merely an imitation of the beauty within nature, it is actually higher than it. This is because the beauty of art, Hegel tells us, is begotten of mind, and the creations of spirit are superior to the contingency and accident of impersonal nature, because spirit entails freedom and intellectual conception. Whereas what you find within nature basically arrives at that state through happenstance. The sun, to use Hegel's own example, lacks the properly notional power of self-differentiation, this power of dialectical development, which is of course just the negation of self-consciousness itself. Hegel notes that further proof of the need to contrast nature and art lies in the fact that no one has ever proposed a systematic science to try to account for the beauty of nature, whereas we do have that within the realm of art. It's simply called aesthetics. And if you really think about it, this makes sense, because the subject matter of natural beauty is inherently felt to be something indefinite, or rather to be not notional in the proper sense of the term. On the contrary, um, the problem of art precisely is the problem of the embodiment of the notion, as I will explain in the course of these videos. He admits that there are certain difficulties regarding aesthetics. For example, although it is obvious that art gives pleasure, in fact, it would seem to be defined as mere entertainment, it is far less clear whether something like that should be treated scientifically or systematically. In fact, treating mere recreation and relaxation the same as really serious subject matter would seem to be inherently unjustifiable or misplaced. Further, it is somewhat clear that art might be thought of as a mediator between reason and sensuous association, lying somewhere between the mere um, apprehension of colors 
tactile sensations and sounds and the rational idea as such, it is far less clear whether reason actually gains the least benefit from art because this lower stance would seem to negate reason's need to maintain a standard of purity and self-sameness, even if we consider beauty as merely instrumental, it's a means to a higher or serious end beyond itself. Hegel notes that critics might still claim that the means by which it achieves uh, this goal are still inherently unworthy because art as mere appearance would seem to be deception that is in contradiction with the truth which reason is actually seeking after. A second objection, of course, is that art doesn't actually deal with thought in the proper sense of the term, but rather with feeling or, at best, with imagination. What we enjoy in art is precisely the plasticity and freedom of creative expression we find within it, yet this would seem to directly negate the dry and strict forms of rational law, rule, and system. Indeed, science inevitably abstracts from the particular to provide the universal law, whereas art provides countless aesthetic forms which are each excessively particular and perhaps intrinsically incompatible with the regulative functions of system. We can only really grasp art if we consider it with no subordination to other objects beyond itself, but rather as free and specifically when art might enter the same sphere that religion and philosophy also share in order to bring the divine to consciousness. Art is significant because for many people, Hegel notes, it is only through art and not through philosophy that the absolute can be disclosed. You do not find sophisticated philosophy within every single community that has walked the earth, but you really do find art as something of a universal, which uh, quote-unquote unadvanced peoples might also still use. Likewise, Hegel notes that what is really special about art is that it presents the most exalted subject matter in sensuous form. In a certain sense, Art heals a rift between the immediacy of sensation and self-consciousness's progression or self-differentiation beyond immediacy, which is, of course, the defining feature of the mediation of negativity. Art brings consciousness back to the immediacy of sensation while still somehow disclosing the absolute. Yet, crucially, it creates the work of art from its own resources rather than passively observe the contingent beauty which had already been given in nature. Further, claims that art is lowly because it is deception of mere appearance misses the point that an appearance or show is, in fact, essential to actuality. There could be no such thing as truth if it didn't appear, or rather, let itself appear, as I quote Hegel himself. Art makes actual that which is essentially and really true through the appearance, which is treated as deception only in comparison with the mundane appearances of ordinary waking experience, an attitude which, however, misses the irony that we can only discover that which lays claim to truly being real if we go beyond the mundane flow of ordinary experience, for that which is really real is not just any physical object in our midst, but rather that which has the independence of substance of mind. Art ironically proves the mundane objects of ordinary experience to be less of a reality by implanting into this world an appearance of a more exalted rank born of mind, because the work of art brings us face to face with the eternal powers paramount in history, as I quote Hegel himself. Ironically, it is precisely because art is shine, or the play on words in German, it's show or deception, that it holds the advantage of being able to gesture beyond itself to the higher spiritual value while still making this hermeneutically accessible to the intelligence of the human mind, even within what seems to be the lowly realm of sensation. Contrary to expectation, nature has more difficulty disclosing the idea to the human mind, despite being non-deceptive. While Hegel uh, never said that art is dead, he did admit that man had progressed beyond the point at which art could be considered the highest medium through which the absolute might achieve hermeneutical disclosure. As I had mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, religion and philosophy had indeed been fleshed out on a properly notional level in early modernity, and proof of this historical fact can be found in the way that in 
Kant's era, we no longer find art to be worthy of reverence or worship as it had been in earlier times. Rather, by the Enlightenment, art is understood to be, by definition, an occasion for subjective reflection. In Kant's critique of judgment, uh, the experience of art differs from, say, a scientific experience because you don't actually have the concept to tell you what it is that you're experiencing. And it is for that reason alone that you're able to have the enjoyment of art because the subjective faculties can launch into free play because it's not determined by a concept which is readily available for understanding what it is that you're seeing. Yet it is precisely because art is now a thing to be contemplated rather than revered immediately or merely enjoyed sensuously that a science of art is uniquely possible and in fact necessary within modernity. Only now can we actually ascertain its nature with the highest standard of clarity and intellectual comprehension. Because thinking is in fact not highest when left in its naive state of mere thought, but rather when it achieves a grasp of itself in the other, Art is closer to spirit because it allows consciousness to recover itself from an alien factor into a thought expression as such. This is because notion grasps in itself both self and opposite, for the true universal is that which cancels the alienation through which it passes as you understand Hegel's general idea of dialectic. Contrary to expectation, art is not completely arbitrary in its forms, for the embodiment of the notion is indeed the real goal. As I quote Hegel himself, it is only through one determinate content that the form adequate to its embodiment is defined. Therefore, we have to really talk about beauty, but although it might first, uh, at first glance seem like a simple idea, closer examination reveals beauty to be not so easy to pin down to any one definition. Traditionally, beauty has been defined not only through its content, but also through its manner of self-presentation. Speaking of art's content is, however, tricky because all symbols are only really understood if you grasp the meaning they gesture towards. The irony of a symbol is that you fail to understand it if all you take is the symbol by itself. In the same way, art must possess significance, which will not appear to have told its tale simply in the fact of particular lines, curves, surfaces, indentations, reliefs of stonework, particular colors, tones, sounds of words, or whatever medium, in fact, art might employ, as I quote Hegel himself, its function is to unveil an inward or ideal vitality of emotion, soul, a content, a mind, which is precisely what we mean by the significance of a work of art. We seek the idea of the beautiful, but are skeptical whether this really is an idea in the platonic sense of a single, unchanging universal which is only really grasped if it's abstracted away from all of its particular instantiations. Hegel notes that when you're dealing with art, the idea of the beautiful must combine metaphysical universality with the determinate content of real particularity. And this makes sense because the particular forms of the beautiful are those through which the universal must pass in order to actualize itself dialectically in a process which is not at all irrelevant to the idea itself. Another difficulty is that the beautiful has been treated thus far as not the kind of thing which admits of being a universal idea, rather the beautiful is treated as a certain effect of having a feeling of pleasure from an experience which, treated that way, cannot help but drop down to a private contingent and sentimentalist status. A work of art, however, can be understood as being subsumed under the following three determinations. The first is to be a product of the creative agency of man rather than of nature. The second is to be created for man and specifically for manifestation to the senses. And the third is to be bound up with an end. On one hand, we know that art is an activity of man, and yet it doesn't seem to be a strict method like other skills are. Rather, the whole point of creative expression is that it goes beyond rules. In Kant, this becomes the idea of the artist as a genius who, even 
he or she can't explain how they create their works of art. Schiller similarly explicitly rejected all rules and intentionally ran counter to them in the process of making great art. This rejection of rules, however, must consider the differences among types of art. Music, for example, deals with the pre-intellectual motion of the soul. This is what Nietzsche would call the immediacy of the will, and therefore something like this makes sense. You do find that musical talent develops in one's early years against the rigid structure of rules. Poetry, on the other hand, is not like that. It requires that the poet have a certain maturity, the level of life experience and explicit thought before it can ripen. The famous story of John Milton writing a, an early poem to his father, who was a banker, asking him to make a deposit and then wait for um, the investment to pay off later on was reflected in the fact that uh, John Milton himself, of course, authored Paradise Lost at a time when he had lost his eyesight and had to dictate the poem to a secretary, and yet still demonstrated evidence of an enormous amount of uh, reading and uh, knowledge in a number of subjects that he had acquired over a whole lifetime. This, of course, begs the question whether the work of art is a merely external and dead object which lacks the life force which, of course, can only really be found in nature, right? This is the idea that fuels the belief that the beauty of art is inherently below that of nature. To the extent that the work of art displays motion, it would seem to be mere show. It would be a deceptive appearance behind which, obviously, there's nothing except inanimate stone, wood, or canvas of which the work of art is quote-unquote really made. This attitude misses the point that a work of art is only as true as it originates from the spirit of man, and it doesn't actually leave that soil, it remains within it. Yet the irony is that the spiritual value is hermeneutically disclosed with greater purity and clarity in the medium of art than would be possible in the phenomena of ordinary experience. This intentionally negates the traditional Platonic notion uh, art is the copy of a copy, or a secondary imitation twice removed from the real idea. It is precisely because art had undergone a certain passage through mind, which nature had not undergone, that it can manifest the idea more purely than any natural object could. The painting of the landscape is actually more spiritually pure than the real landscape itself. Also, at the level of temporality, the work of art discloses the idea with permanence, whereas the natural object is transitory. It soon vanishes. In accord with the short span of the natural life cycle, or the processes of decay and corruption to which it would be subject. Another objection is that nature is higher than art because it was authored by God, whereas art was authored by man. Because the mind of God is obviously the superior of the two, it is clear whose product would be better. Hegel notes that this misses the point that there is divinity in man too, not to mention that God is more adequately honored in the spiritual disclosure of art, precisely because God too is spirit, rather than a mere natural entity which could be adequately represented by the lower objects of nature. Another question is, what is the need that stimulates man to produce art in the first place, and is such an act really necessary? Contrary to expectation, the impulse to create art is actually higher than the lower instincts which are oriented towards mere survival, because the object of this impulse for art is the absolute itself. The need for art arises in man precisely because he's a thinking consciousness rather than a mere biological organism, or rather mind is for itself rather than merely in itself, typical Hegelian distinction. As mind, man uses the power of self-actualization to reduplicate himself by overcoming the alienation in the other and then recognizing himself in it. This is, of course, exactly what art is. Yet this alteration is not limited to external objects. Man is never really content to leave his own pre-given natural form unchanged. He strives to change himself, whether it be even in the quote-unquote primitive forms of ornamentation or bodily disfiguration. He cites Chinese foot crushing, but you could just look at um, Hollywood to find the quote-unquote most perfect people, 
are still not content uh, with their own appearance and undergo plastic surgery at a very troubling uh, level within that industry. Hegel now turns to considering art qua something which had been produced for sense apprehension as such. He asks, is the purpose of art just to arouse the feeling of pleasure, as perhaps Kant would argue? Talk of feeling is unsatisfactorily vague, says Hegel, because the distinctions among different emotional states is quite unclear. Where's the boundary that actually separates fear from anxiety, from dread, etc.? The lack of objective criteria to distinguish one from the other is precisely due to the fact that an emotional state is by definition purely subjective, since it belongs only to me. In other words, looking for the objective distinctions is inherently contra self-contradictory. Nevertheless, attempts have been made to isolate the faculty of subjective appreciation of beauty. The name for this is, of course, taste, as Kant tells us. Lacking the universality of concepts, the appreciation of art requires instead a certain universality of agreement over how a given work of art might stimulate one's faculties into a harmonious free play based on having a pleasurable combination of sense data. Although it is true that you don't understand a work of art with a universal concept, you still have this understanding that anybody of good taste would agree that Mozart's music is better than that of Ariana Grande, if you can even call the latter music at all. Hegel disagrees, however, with this overemphasis on art as an object of sense apprehension, which is to be appreciated without notional appreciation in the mind as such. On the contrary, for Hegel, art is valued precisely because it addresses mind. It is the higher satisfaction of mind rather than the lower satisfaction of mere sense reception, which accounts for the same aesthetic enjoyment which Kant was trying to deal with. The mind's stance, by the way, is not one of passive reception of sense data, but rather it is a stance of desire. Desire in its negativity is not content to just stand by and appreciate external objects as they already are. Desire seeks to consume the object in its most primitive form by literally eating it, as you also find in the fourth section of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Theoretical contemplation differs from that sort of desire because it does stand back and leave the object as it is in order to understand it with universal concepts rather than alter it or consume it. This is, of course, known as science. Science differs also by converting the sensuous object into an abstract form of thought. You only really um, have it if you have the universal and the law. Art differs from lower desire because it does not consume the object. Um, it does leave it in its present state to appreciate it on aesthetic grounds. But it differs from science also by allowing the work to retain its radical singularity. The whole point is for it to be disclosed as so many colors, sounds, and other sense data rather than to translate these into the abstract universal concept which goes beyond them. Art is therefore something like a midway ground. It's not yet the pure thought of the universal concept, nor the mere sensuous thereness of the object as a mere material thing. Hegel says himself, in this way the sensuous is spiritualized in art, or in other words, the life of spirit comes to dwell in it under sensuous guise. For this reason, a product of art is only possible insofar as it has received its passage through the mind, and has originated from the productive, productive activity of mind. One cannot help asking, therefore, what is the purpose of art? Is it mere imitation of nature? If so, art is always already a failure if it can never hope to actually compete with what had already been made naturally. If art is imitation, the question is not about its own inherent beauty, but rather the simple yes-no question whether it has correctly copied its referent. This leads to the question of what the true content of art is. You only really have the content of art, qua art, if you awaken slumbering emotions within the self and then fill the heart to the brim with them. The emotional content is not accidental, but rather essential, for after it is subtracted out, one is left not with art, but with the inanimate uh, medium of wood, stone, or canvas. This typically leads to the view that the purpose of art 
is to purify the passions by providing moral instruction over how they should be properly used. It is not at all clear, however, how exactly art might do this. Hegel notes that it was precisely because the story of Mary Magdalene portrayed the prostitute's repentance as so beautiful that many people were inadvertently tempted to commit the sin, because they could only repent of it if they had first had something to be forgiven for. The great contradiction, of course, inherent in the very question of moral action itself is that the battle to act ethically is indicative of a general contradiction between the universal ideal of the ethical law and the natural contingencies in which any living subject has to be embodied. Not coincidentally, the solution remains a hypothetical should of the law, while a conflicting movement to and fro is never actually resolved at this level. The truth can only come to us in reconciliation, which can only be through the mediation of a certain self-accomplishing actual presence, which goes beyond the Kantian um, abstraction of what should be. Likewise, the moral guidance hypothesis regarding art is proven to be completely false. This is not the purpose for which art exists. As opposed to this, we must maintain, says Hegel, that it is art's function to reveal truth under the mode of art's sensuous or material configuration, to display the reconciled antithesis previously described, and by this means to prove that it possesses its final aim within itself in this representation in short and self-revelation. Likewise, we can finally say now that in its most general definition, the beauty of art has become recognized as one of the means uh, which resolve and bring back to unity that antithesis and contradiction between mind and nature as they repose in abstract alienation from each other. Art is about a certain resolu uh, resolution of the contradiction between spirit and nature rather than serve a merely utilitarian purpose as moral instruction or non-serious stimulation as entertainment. Likewise, Likewise, we are finally able to pass on to considerations of the subject matter of art itself. Hegel has established art as that which issues from the absolute idea itself. Likewise, its end is not mere entertainment or moral instruction, but rather the sensuous presentation of the absolute as such. Art cannot be totally abstract for this reason, but must have some concrete form. This is in accord with Hegel's general philosophy, since, as I quote him himself, everything that possesses truth for spirit, no less than as part of nature, is essentially concrete, and, despite its universality, possesses both ideality and particularity essentially within it. Hegel claims that... This can be demonstrated by the three Abrahamic religions. Only Christianity satisfied this need to go beyond abstraction by ironically positing the absolute God himself as the concrete man of Jesus Christ. Similarly, the point of art is that it too can disclose the absolute, but only in an all too particular medium. Hegel claims that the Christian God also ranks higher than the Greek gods because whereas the Greek gods maybe get it right at the level of human bodily form and particularity, the Christian God, Jesus, transcends the limitations of the pagan gods because he is no doubt a concrete personality but under the mode of pure spiritual actuality who is cognized as, as spirit and in spirit. His medium of determinate existence is therefore essentially knowledge of the mind and not external natural shape. Likewise, if we consider a relation between concrete form and spiritual idea, it is clear that the higher truth consequently is spiritual content which has received the shape adequate to the conception of its essence. The problem of art is quite literally how to embody the notion in the aesthetic concrete form. Of course, Hegel does not interpret notion to be a single, fixed, pre-given ideal in the way that Plato would. Rather, he emphasizes that notion is constrained to traverse a series of stages rooted in this very notional concept, and to this course of stages which it unfolds to itself corresponds a coalescent series immediately related therewith of the plastic types of art under the configuration whereof mind as art spirit pre presents to itself the consciousness of itself. The phases of art follow from the paradox that the notional evolution is universal, but the particular aesthetic embodiments are all bound by the particularity of sensuous 
manifestation. Likewise, the following study as a whole consists of three parts. In the first uh, general uh, uh, part, you have the universal ideal of art or the idea of beauty treated at great length. In the second, you have the particular stages of the evolution for the embodiment of the ideal he talks of, symbolic art, classical art, and romantic art, as I will finish this video discussing at, as well. And then finally, in the third section, you have a consideration of the sensuous realization of its shapes and its consummation in a system of the several arts in their genre and species. He talks about specific, I guess, uh, media of art within that third section. So, because art is always not just um, about the idea, but rather the idea as carried into concrete form in the direction of express realization, and as having entered into immediate and adequate unity with such a reality, in theory, we have the idea that art should embody the um, notion perfectly. In reality, of course, it is far easier to think of art which has failed at this task than has succeeded. Hegel notes that Chinese, Hindu, and Egyptian art, for example, were all failures at the task of embodying the notion in a medium adequate to the idea, but he specifically emphasized that this was not at all due to a lack of talent on the part of the artists. Rather, the project was kind of already doomed to fail, ironically enough, because the absolute was not understood on anything except a purely abstract level. The requirement for art to have determinate content, therefore, can only be satisfied if the absolute itself has some determinate content. And this is why... Um, Art has to appear within a certain evolution of particular stages of forms. In the first general phase, which um, Hegel considers that of symbolic art, he notes that um, you have a, a certain external relation between the idea of what art is supposed to be about and the medium in which you actually represent it. And um, this is something which is inadequate because the idea is because we're not Platonists is not a fixed given because the idea at this level is initially defective and merely caught up in an untrue determinacy it is embodied in art which will of course also be just as inadequate in the first phase art is defined more by the strained effort of plastic experimentation than the disclosure of the power of genuine representation Initially, in fact, the idea is treated as something so external to the material that nature is just left as it is. Ironically, art itself fails to happen in this phase because you're merely um, allowing natural beauty to appear where you should be pursuing the beauty of art. Because the theme is revealed to be purely external and negatively related to the medium, the artist finds that he actually can distort the natural object into ever more grotesque and unnatural forms. But this is not really doing good art. He's simply stabbing in the dark like a drunkard who lacks any sense of finesse. Ironically, this happens not because the natural objects actually are inadequate to embody an idea which had truly obtained the status of greatness. Rather, it is precisely because the grand idea here is a fraud, which is still totally indeterminate and therefore incapable of undergoing the aesthetic adaptation which alone can be held now by the malleable natural object itself. Likewise, at this phase, the art has failed to embody the notion because the relation between the two is revealed to be purely negative. Either the absolute idea is incorrectly attributed to the most unworthy of mere material objects, or it is found to have contempt of any concrete object whatsoever and rejects all of them. In the second phase, in the second phase of classical art, you find that classical sculpture presents the human form in a medium which actually is adequate to embody its content, and therefore it seems to resolve the merely negative relation which had defined the phase of symbolic art. No longer is the theme merely external to its medium, but rather finds itself at home within it. For this reason, Hegel says, the classical type of art is the first to present us with the creation and vision of the complete ideal and to establish the same as a realized fact. Classical art does move beyond symbolic art by focusing not just on any natural form as a worthy medium as had been attempted before, but rather on that one natural form which actually does fit the theme of the spirit as such, and that's, of course, the form of the human body. 
Contrary to the stereotypical view that personification and anthropomorphism are defects which negate the ideal of great art, Hegel notes that the human form actually is the one best equipped to present the spiritual ideal in a form which fits the human mind. It is the uh, superior medium for hermeneutical comprehension, both objectively and subjectively. At this point, however, spirit loses its eternal and absolute character, comes to be redefined as every bit as particular as the individual body which had been depicted in the sculpture. This, however, is a defect which undoes classical art and leads to the transition to the final phase, in romantic art, you have a certain undoing of the temporary unity of idea and reality which classical sculpture had seemed to achieve by revealing that the kind of subjectivity to be treated in art cannot be limited to the corporeal form of a statue. Subjectivity must be understood as the absolute inspiration of romanticism. As I quote Hegel himself, as a matter of fact, in this fusion, mind itself is not represented agreeably to its true notional concept. Mind is the infinite subjectivity of the idea, which as absolute inwardness is not capable of freely expanding in its entire independence, so long as it remains within the mold of the bodily shape, fused therein as in the existence wholly congenial to it. Hegel revisits the distinction between the pagan gods, which more or less fit their corporeal form, and the ideal of Jesus as the absolute spirit. To show that romantic art is necessary to capture a view of the infinity of subjectivity, which is exactly what separates human thinkers from the lower animals. Like Gadamer would do much later, Hegel considers man to be the kind of being which rises above its instinctual determinations and the ecological stimuli in its habitat to have a higher level of freedom than the lower animals could. While Gadamer credits language with this magic, Hegel credits self-consciousness. Interestingly, man rises above the status of an animal precisely because he realizes that he is an animal because he has the power of self-consciousness. Art now must reflect spirits striving after freedom rather than mere sense perception. Likewise, now the emphasis is on the emotional realm as such rather than the body. Imagination discovers an incredible power it has to distort its portrayal of events at will, even to the point of creating the most absurd of caricatures eventually leading it to withdraw from the external medium into its own do domain entirely, in which you find the end of art and the shift to religion and philosophy, but only for this very specific reason. 